prior and existing, existing nuclear power will also be excluded from the base amount, which would then mean, my colleagues, when you take the 20 percent renewable electricity standard, the amount for a renewable electricity standard will be lower and less of a burden state for states to meet. Now, we're going to have an amendment later on talking about the definition of nuclear energy as a renewable energy resource, but that's not the debate here. It's just saying <coughs> that you're going to recognize nuclear power as a source of renewable energy. And in fact, <coughs> the way the bill's written now, it's only going to be recognized for new construction. And we all know this could be 10, 15, 20 years. So my amendments are saying, let's recognize nuclear energy that's already built and exists. And I particularly bring this attention to folks in Arkansas that have a nuclear power plant. Uh, obviously, in Florida, we have one. Around Tampa, we have a nuclear power plant. So that nuclear power plant in Tampa, under the manager's amendment, would not be recognized only new construction. So all that nuclear power in Tampa would not get credit under the uh, base amount when you determine what the retail electric supplier's base amount would be for the state. And I think the nuclear power plant in Tampa should be. Now, we're trying to build a, a nuclear plant in the northern part of my district, but that's going to take a long time. The bill says you can recognize that, but I say why discriminate? Why not also include those particular, those nuclear plants around the country? not just in Arkansas, but they're in California, Connecticut, Florida, Georgia. Um, I've got a list here, if anybody wants to see it, Illinois, Kansas, Louisiana, New Jersey, New York, Michigan, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Ohio, Tennessee. I could go on. Almost most of the states in the Union have a nuclear power plant. The manager's amendment excludes them from being part of the... Um, credit for green energy because nuclear energy has no CO2 emissions. So your state, if it has a nuclear power plant, will not benefit. So I hope you'll look at my amendment in a bipartisan fashion and say, okay, the manager's amendment says it's okay if it's built, it'll be part of the solution, but if it's existing, it won't be. So by taking out those 11 words on page 23 of the manager's amendment, we essentially move this into the equation which allows you, your state, to ultimately, it'll be easier for you to meet the RES and more importantly, the retail electric supplier's base amount will be lower. So 20% of that lower amount will mean it'll be easy for your state to comply, but more importantly, this simple change would allow states that have existing nuclear power plants to more easily meet the renewable electric standards. So it, it has one of fairness, 
because the manager's amendment said new plants can have it. So this is fairness. Why not recognize old plants? And two, it will allow renewable electric standard to be more easily met by your state. So I, I think it should be a given, Mr. Chairman. Perhaps. Gentlemen, yield. Yeah, I'd be glad to yield. Uh, your staff uh, told us that the amendment you wanted to bring up was to take nuclear out of the baseline. This amendment defines nuclear as a renewable. No, it's just the opposite. Uh, we thought you were going to offer one amendment. We're not for either. No, you're not for e I can't convince you on this then, huh? Uh, well, it, 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 without objection, gentlemen, be given an additional minute. Sure. And I'd like uh, to I would, I would appreciate this colloquy because Thank you. Um, I would like to understand your objection because I think a lot of members on your side that have nuclear power plants that I've just mentioned would benefit, as I say, in fairness and also in the fact that it would be more easily for them to meet the renewable electric standard. Well, I thank you for yielding. We spent a lot of time negotiating with members on the renewable electricity standard. And as you point out, several members expressed concern that nuclear power was not addressed in the standard. So we uh, struck a, be a delicate balance. We agreed that electricity from new nuclear generation units would come out of the utilities baseline. In other words, utilities wouldn't have to generate more renewable power as a result of bringing new nuclear power uh, plant online. Uh, the RES doesn't create any disincentive for nuclear power. On the other hand, nuclear power doesn't receive renewable electricity credits under the RES because it's not a renewable power. Nuclear power is fueled by uranium, which is a finite natural resource. It's also a mature technology currently supplying 18 percent of our nation's electricity. If nuclear power received credits under the RES, the standard would have to be much, much higher. So that's the, uh, that's what was our thinking about the matter. And uh, we did well, part of what you wanted, but not uh, all of what you wanted. Uh, Mr. We can't Chairman, go as far as you want to go. Uh, my staff has indicated that you might have the wrong amendment yes. that you're talking about. Is it a possibility that the amendment that I have before me and which I've described, you don't have that same amendment? We're not talking about the same thing. Um, Because I think I think what you, I think we have a little. I think you recognize that you might have might have the wrong amendment. I think there has been a misunderstanding. Yeah, uh, uh, but uh, would you prefer the uh, the other amendment uh, to be the by unanimous consent? We you, we're yes, let's do that, that by order? unanimous consent. So okay. then you have the right amendment. Because so uh, uh, what we're proposing is that uh, the, by unanimous consent the amendment by Mr. Stearns that will be uh, in order to, for consideration at this point will be the amendment that uh, will keep nuclear power, uh, uh, deal with nuclear power in, in the, on the baseline question. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hey, let's just, yeah. I'm sorry for the confusion. I don't know if uh, well, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes. Who seeks recognition? Yes. This is the right yeah. one. Mr. Chairman, I'm asking which is the, is the amendment that was passed out the amendment we are considering, or is it now? No, the amendment we're considering is the amendment that's now being passed out, and the amendment that members received uh, is not the amendment we are considering. And let me do you want to uh, do you want to take another sure. two or three minutes oh, to okay to clarify let me just this? Read the amendment to the amendment in the nature of the substitute offered by myself, page 23, line 8, strike placed in service after the date of enactment of this section. And let me just review, particularly for those on the other side of the aisle that have a nuclear power plant. If you vote against my amendment, what you're saying is when the what's called the total retail electric supplier base amount, which is your total amount of electricity that's used in your state, they're going to include your nuclear power plant. But your nuclear power plant has no CO2 emissions. So it should not be part of it. So let's take an arbitrary figure of, let's say, 10 gigawatts as your total state's power. But that includes your nuclear power, let's say, which is 2 gigawatts. If you take it out and consider it a renewable, then the 20% of your total state will be less. 
It's only fair. If the manager's amendment say it's okay to have nuclear as a renewable after the bill's passed, only new construction, what about all the old construction? So it's, all, it's one of fairness. And second of all, it'll make it easier for your state to meet the renewable electric standards because this power plant will be taken out of your total electricity because it doesn't have CO2 emissions. And so the 20 percent of the number will be less. Now, if there's anybody that doesn't quite understand, I try to make it as simple as possible. And the, the fact that we've had so much what appears to be partisan amendments here, in your opinion, this is not a partisan amendment. This is something, Mr. Chairman, in all honesty, I, I think you would have to say, the arbitrarily say that no nuclear power will be considered except new construction is discouraging those folks that already have nuclear power plants. And I've got, you know, in the state of Illinois, they got, they got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. I mean, so why, Mr. Chairman, should we discourage and prevent those nuclear power plants from getting credit as a renewable so that in the end, their total electricity for the state will come down when you take the nuclear out, and then the 20 percent of the um, the base amount will be less, and they'll be clearly able to comply. So I just uh, ask, uh, again, on the basis of fairness, and two, make your state have an easier time to comply because the 20 percent will be lower. Does that make sense, Mr. Chairman? I, I, I understand your argument, yes. Okay. Mr. Chairman? That's, that's the main thing. And, and I hope members on that side, if you don't understand my argument, let's have it under, because if you vote no against this, you're voting against your existing nuclear power plant. And California's got quite, quite a number of here. And I think, I mean, in your heart of hearts, as much as you're for global warming or as much as you're for uh, renewables, why discriminate against your nuclear power plant that's already existed and pride, provided all that electricity for your state for all these years Give it the benefit of the doubt. Make it part of this solution because there's no CO2 coming from it. Mr. Chairman. Uh, gentleman's time has expired. Uh, Ms. Harmon. Uh, Mr. Chairman, um, I agree that this is not a partisan amendment, and I applaud that. Uh, I think after a very long yesterday, it's nice to start off today uh, with an amendment that um, is, I, I think, pitched to be good policy, but I'm not sure I think it is good policy, and that's why I wanted to ask you a couple of things, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I don't have any nuclear power plants in my district, but there, are, there is nuclear power in California, and I have said uh, on a number of occasions that I do think nuclear power should be part of our mix uh, going forward uh, and perhaps should be in this bill. Nonetheless, uh, I, I'm just asking you, Mr. Chairman, to um, amplify the record on a point you just made, which I think is is where I come out, which is, as I understood it, that uh, uh, nuclear power is not a renewable uh, and that, therefore, if you are trying to come up with the proper standard, you can't grandfather in ex existing nuclear power. Did, did I understand that correctly? And could you explain that a little more uh, for the record so that I'm confident that I'm making the right vote? Yes, I, I, I uh, certainly think nuclear power has to be part of the mix, and we don't discriminate against nuclear power. It, it is going, it's going to be used and, will, and is already being used. But in terms of defining a renewable, it is not a renewable. But in terms of deciding how much we need to get by way of new renewables, we have a compromise. And we've sa uh, said in the future, New nuclear power will not be count, counted in the base, uh, so that um, uh, that that uh, it won't uh, it won't change the amount of uh, it won't require more uh, renewables. But if we go back and bring in all the existing newer uh, existing nuclear power plants, it would mean that the renewables ought to be much higher than the amount we have. So we. Uh, Ha, uh, the compromise dealt with the n amount of renewables that would be required, uh, and we didn't want to uh, make it so high uh, that uh, if we brought in all the old nuclear power plants, it would be a great burden. Ms. Perhaps Ms. Mr. Uh, Markey might want to further 
elaborate on that, but I, I appreciate I think that question. Let me just reclaim my time and say something, then yield to Mr. Markey and Mr. Upton. Um, I, I'm persuaded by that. I, I understand that. I asked you the question so that we could have a clearer record. Um, I, I, I know there are, and I, I know Mr. Markey is going to say this too, uh, enormous safety issues and proliferation issues connected to nuclear power, but nonetheless, Al Gore and uh, President Obama and many others think uh, some nuclear power is in our future, and so do I, and I don't want to discourage it. On the other hand, I don't want to uh, use it to discriminate against uh, the true renewables that we are trying to promote in the bill. I now yield to Mr. Markey. Hey, thank you. I thank the uh, gentlelady very much. Um, 20 percent of our electrical generation in the United States today is nuclear. We have more nuclear power than France has. Mm -hmm. okay? We are the largest nuclear country in terms of electrical generation in the world. Um, it, it, it is a, a technology which in the 1992 um, uh, Energy Policy Act uh, received permission to uh, have an application for construction and operation, meaning a 10-year gap and uh, all compressed down into one application. In the 2005 Energy Act, we actually uh, extended that to uh, the, um, the new smaller 100 uh, uh, megawatt uh, plants. Um, we uh, uh, give it insurance protection, the Price-Anderson Act. Uh, loan guarantees were included in uh, the 2005 and 2007 uh, laws for uh, nuclear uh, power. Mr. Dingell uh, yesterday had an amendment uh, to create a new uh, 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 body that would be able to uh, uh, create, uh, to be, be able to grant loans to the uh, nuclear industry. Um, it is and has been a very favored industry uh, under U.S. law. However, uh, the intent of the um, renewable electricity uh, standard, uh, as we um, have listed um, in the bill, is to provide incentives for a whole range of nascent uh, technologies uh, that have the potential of really providing uh, a new generation of uh, electrical uh, generating capacity for our country. And let me just go down that list. Uh, wind energy, solar energy, these are the technologies that do get credits under this uh, uh, provision. Wind, solar, geothermal, renewable biomass, biogas derived from renewable biomass, qualified hydropower, marine and hydrokinetic renewable energy, fuel cells, landfill gas, Mr. waste. Gentlemen, you. Oh. Gentlemen's time has expired. Can I ask the gentlelady, gentlelady's an time is minute? without objection. The gentlelady be given another. another. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. And can I yield 30 seconds of it to uh, Mr. Markey and 30 seconds to Mr. Upton, please? I thank the gentlelady. Uh, wastewater uh, treatment gas, coal mine methane, qualified waste to energy, including combustion of municipal solid waste and construction and demolition of waste, animal waste, algae. Uh, there's a triple credit in here for distributed generation, uh, efficiency savings in many, many forms. So we're taking all of those new energy technologies that are just exploding uh, and saying, the, and we work with the members to ensure that many definitions that have been excluded, municipal solid waste and, uh, and uh, much of the biomass uh, is now included as part of it. And we worked hard to broaden the definition. Uh, and we think that's where it belongs. Nuclear is a more mature technology. It receives tremendous benefits in other parts of the U.S. Code, uh, but we think this is just a special area. In reclaiming my time, Mr. Markey, I'd like to yield to Mr. Upton. Yeah, I, I thank the gentlelady. How about this, I, Mr. I, Upton? Why don't I uh, call on you for five minutes? Well, I can probably do this in 30 seconds. Then oh, okay. Go ahead. I, I just want to say that, uh, Mr. Mr. Wax, Mr. Chairman, uh, you I think it was you that mentioned a, a few minutes ago about uh, the percentage of renewables. I think on our side, we would t we would accept a higher a renewable percentage if, in fact, we could include nuclear, not only new nuclear, but also old nuclear, existing nuclear. Uh, and, and frankly, I think there is a lot of support on our side to take existing hydro as well. Uh, and if we can increase the number and expand the base to include those, uh, I think you would have pretty much universal support over here. And maybe that is Maybe instead of just negotiating with that side of the aisle, maybe we ought to be talking to some of the folks here. Maybe we can work together on an amendment, and I look forward to doing that. 
Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Uh, to seek second position. Gentleman from Kentucky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I want to support uh, the, the Stearns Amendment about the retail electric supplier's base. And here's, here's why. This is not about nuclear power plants that we're trying to protect here. But each state is going to have to meet this requirement of renewable, 20 percent renewable. And right now, renewables are providing less than around 1 percent of all electricity produced in the country. And the key point is, if a state does not attain that goal, reach that 20 percent, then there's going to be a penalty per kilowatt hour of two and a half cents. And uh, we did a calculation of, of just an average manufacturing plant in my district. The original was a five cent per kilowatt hour penalty, which amounted to over $20,000 a month in increased electrical cost. Well, the 2.5, which you reduced it to 2.5, so that would increase the electrical cost for an average uh, manufacturing plant to over $10,000 a month. So that's why this is so important, because it is going to make it easier for these entities to attain this goal. And if they do not attain the goal, the penalty is going to be upon those people paying the electric rates. because. And that affects the competitiveness of the American industry in providing jobs in America with other countries. And if our electric rates go up, and they will go up, there will, there will be penalties if you do not meet this renewable standard. So I think that's why it makes a lot of sense to adopt the Stearns Amendment uh, to increase, to provide, uh, make it easier for these states and entities to meet this uh, requirement. Because if they don't meet the requirement, there's going to be some consequences. And uh, with that, I would yield back. The, but, I, I, I would yield to the gentleman from Oregon. I, I thank the gentleman for yielding because I, I think he makes a very good point, and I think the gentleman from Michigan makes a good point as well. At least if you took all these into account in the baseline, you'd have a more accurate reflection of what's renewable and not, and then you could go from there. We may debate what that percentage should be from there. I look at, uh, you know, the, the chairman makes the comment that you can't re necessarily include nuclear because it's not a renewable. And I guess I can understand that logic. What the logic I don't get, though, is hydro is clearly a renewable. And you don't include all hydro in the baseline. So the last uh, discussion draft last week, I believe the date that was set was hydro after 2000 or 2001 was renewable, 2001. In this bill now, hydro after 92 is renewable, and I'm trying to figure out how water flowing through a dam producing electricity is renewable if that facility was created after 92, but if it was developed during FDR's time, it's not renewable energy. I don't, I don't understand that. I don't think there's a logical explanation for that, and I think either hydropower is renewable energy or it's not. And if it's renewable, it should be included. And yet the majority, or at least some on the majority side, say hydropower is only renewable if it is put in place by some arbitrary date, 1992. I'm reclaiming my yes. time. I, I yield to the gentleman from Indiana. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I think we have a, a wonderful opportunity here. And I'm curious if my friend, Ms. Harmon of California, would be, would be interesting. It, it, would be interested if we could convince Mr. Stearns to withdraw this amendment and what we do is we go ahead and expand the base to include hydro and nuclear and whether the gentlelady would be uh, supportive of, of uh, offering such an amendment with us. Um, I like the tone of this conversation a lot, Mr. Boyer, and in the abstract, my answer to that would be yes, but I would, you know, it is the chairman and a few others who have carefully constructed a deal to promote new sources of energy. That's the conversation we've been having here, uh, including new nuclear uh, as a source of energy. And as you heard me say, uh, I am not against nuclear, and I gather from the comments of Mr. Markey and uh, the chairman that they're not either. I don't know. I would put the question to them. Is there a way forward here to revisit this in some way uh, at this point? Or uh, I'd certainly 
suggest once uh, the bill is reported from committee that we continue this discussion and perhaps yeah. maybe come up with I, something. I'd like to more. reclaim my time, and the chairman might want to respond in just a minute, but I'd like to yield to the gentlelady from Tennessee. I thank the gentleman for yielding, and I do support the amendment. And I support looking at nuclear, including nuclear and hydroelectric power, as renewables. In Tennessee, we know that wind and solar. I've got an article I'd love to submit for the record, Mr. Chairman, and it talks about TVA and a forum that was held to look at renewables. And there's a quote from Senator Alexander in here saying the one renewable source that will not work well for Tennessee is wind power power. So in trying to do our part, we know that hydroelectric power and nuclear power is an imperative that we we use. We know if it's not included in the RES that it will be impossible for us to meet those standards and that our electric rates per consumer, and consumers do look at rates, will go up 42 percent is what is expected. So I would ask that we, we do consider that, and I yield back to the gentleman from Kentucky. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, chair recognizes Mr. Markey. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, very much. Um, again, for new nuclear power, which is constructed in our country, it is excluded from the baseline in terms of what the renewable electricity uh, standard is. Uh, the Energy uh, Information Agency expects 20,000 new megawatts of nuclear capacity to come online through the year 2030 with all the current incentives for nuclear power that are uh, on the books. Uh, electric utilities have filed 17 new applications with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for 26 new reactor operating licenses just over the last couple of years. Uh, th there are loan guarantee programs out there. We provide the, the Price-Anderson insurance protection for them. Uh, it's a mature industry. These are the largest utilities in the United States um, that, for the most part, constitute the uh, electric utility industry. They are a very wealthy industry. On the other hand, the American wind industry says that if this amendment was adopted, that it would reduce by 38 percent the amount of new wind power that would be generated in the United States, that there would be a 25 percent uh, reduction overall in the uh, new uh, generation of electricity from the renewables that we have defined in the bill. Well, we are trying to encourage now uh, 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 renewables from waste, from biomass, from wind, from solar, from geothermal, from that whole list. Uh, nuclear has done extremely well over the years. It continues to do well in the 1992, 2005 and 2007 energy bills. They were and continue to have tremendous support. And again, as I pointed out, uh, Mr. Dingell's uh, amendment yesterday opens up a new program where upwards of 30 percent of that program can also go towards new nuclear technology. We are talking about something here that is very exciting to um, the American people. Uh, it represents um, a breakthrough in terms of all of these new technologies that have been bottled up and are ready to explode. Uh, and it is not meant to be achieved at the expense of nuclear power or coal. They each have huge roles uh, in this mix. In fact, um, the nuclear industry believes that just by moving to a cap and trade system, by putting a price on carbon, by saying that uh, there has to be less carbon in our society, that it is central to the, the complete revival of the nuclear industry. So cap and trade itself uh, is something central to their long-term well-being. They all say that. In fact, Constellation Energy, which is one of the uh, largest uh, nuclear utilities in the United States in endorsing this legislation, Constellation Energy applauds the proposed climate change legislation as a promising first step in promoting greater investment in renewable technology, energy efficiency and new nuclear. That is their press release that they put out uh, two days ago. They are one of the small handful of, of the largest nuclear power companies in the United States. So again, there is a balance. We want to render to nuclear the things that are nuclear and render to wind and solar and, and, and well, the gentleman from yield. waste yeah, well, the gentleman and, yield. and the others well, the the are theirs. The gentleman and, yield. Uh, let, let, me, yield. Let, let me continue, please. Um, that is really the, 
uh, the the dilemma that we have here. But at the, the same gentleman, time, with, 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 yeah, let, I, I will yield to the gentleman from California. Let me, let me see if I understand this. We we want to develop more renewable alternatives that are uh, carbon that do not include carbon emissions in our electricity. We want more of all of the above. We want to diversify our portfolio of sources of electricity. We don't want to do this at the expense of coal. We don't want to do it at the expense of nuclear. We don't want to do it at the expense of hydro. But we want to encourage investment in these new renewable fuels. So uh, this section provides that we're going to have uh, 15 percent renewable and up to 20 percent combination of renewable and, uh, and efficiency. And if the state can't get to the 15 percent, we let them go to 12 percent. But if we count in all the, all the existing sources of electricity that are already used, like hydropower and nuclear, and say, if you've done a good, you've done a good enough job, that's enough, you don't really promote this new renewable fuels. Now, some people say, well, let's just raise the amount of renewable fuels that we'll require and count in the baseline, hydro and nuclear. Well, if we did that, we'd have to readjust the numbers in order to encourage that renewable fuels market. The compromise that was worked out uh, in the proposal that's before us is said, let's let renew, we'll count new nuclear uh, and uh, not in the baseline uh, so we can, in effect, allow that to be encouraged, especially with the new technology for nuclear, but not to call it a renewable. Right. Uh, is, that, is that where we are? And Mr. Chairman. That, that is correct, Mr. Yeah, my, uh, Mr. Markey's time has expired. Who Move is, to strike the last word. And Mr. Blunt is next uh, on the Republican side. Uh, uh, thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On, you've, you mentioned a couple of times the compromise that this bill, this, this language represents. It, it does seem to me, first of all, the compromise was a compromise that the majority reached because we, we haven't really been in this discussion. Uh, and the whole idea of renewables, I mean, there are many people in this room and certainly on this side of the room that believe that hydro is a renewable. Uh, the argument that nuclear is not a renewable because, because of the uranium content, it seems to me that's like arguing that wind is not a renewable because of the metal it takes to build the towers. Uh, nuclear is clearly largely an investment that, does, that, that, we would, that I would see as a potential renewable. But that argument aside, since there, I think there is a legitimate disagreement there, it would seem to me that the compromise is actually the language that Mr. Stearns has recommended. Uh, many of us believe nuclear should be a renewable. Many of us apparently believe it should not be a renewable. May, the compromise should be, let's just take nuclear current and future off the table that counts toward this calculation. Uh, and that would be the logical compromise, not uh, the idea that, and there's no carbon. Uh, I, there's, there seem to be a lot of different agendas and goals here. Uh, we talk about how the, the, agenda, the goal is no carbon, but then somehow existing hydro uh, and uh, most new hydro doesn't meet the, the category, it doesn't meet the, the standard of a renewable. Or the goal is no carbon, but nuclear, new or old, doesn't count as a renewable. At best, it counts as a neutral, because you don't count new nuclear against the number uh, that the utility is trying to measure against. Uh, the compromise would be to take it all off the table rather than to decide to take some of it off the table. And uh, that would uh, that would be much more in the middle of this debate Gentlemen, yield. Uh, than a debate that uh, we're going to count some nuclear, we, 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 some existing nuclear uh, doesn't have any impact on anything except it counts toward the, the overall baseload. New nuclear counts as a neutral, apparently, because it doesn't, it just doesn't count in any way that impacts the situation, no matter how much you've invested. Uh, and hydro doesn't count at all. Uh, is is and I would I would yield to the chairman. I, I thank you for yielding. This is a compromise we would have liked to have worked out with the Republican members, but uh, the Republican members did not wish to negotiate it with us. So we negotiate with and have the agreement with this proposal with Duke Energy, American Electric Power, Edison Electric Institute, Exelon, PG&E Corporation, FPL Group. Entergy, Austin Energy, Constellation Energy, Seattle City Light, Public Service Enterprise, 
PNM resources. The people who provide us the electricity, they think this makes sense, and, uh, uh, and, and I would hope that uh, I could see what you're arguing, but if these groups that provide the electricity thinks this uh, uh, serves their interest as well as the uh, public interest, uh, I think we have already a good compromise. So the compromise is between the majority and essentially the utility companies, Mr. Chairman. Is that what you're telling me? The uh, compromise is among majority members and with the, in, with the industries okay. who are involved in making sure that they can meet the demands of their uh, ratepayers, their consumers, and, um, and live within the direction we're taking to encourage new renewables as a, a, a diversification of our sources for electricity. Well, in that discussion, I, I don't know how, how much how much power those those uh, those negotiators brought to the table, uh, but I, I think it's a poor compromise, and I support uh, Stern's amendment. And I would yield uh, to Mr. Walden. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would just point out too in that discussion the the quote from Peter Orzog, the now. Uh, head of the Office of Management Budget, when he was CBO director in 2007, he said, if you don't auction the permits, it would represent the largest corporate welfare program that's ever been enacted in the history of the United States. All the evidence suggests that what would occur is that corporate profits would increase by approximately the value of the permits. And I know that the allocation process uh, that was Thank negotiated, apparently, um, sure allocates those permits, doesn't auction them. I would get back to hydro, though. And the, the majority says they want to encourage new renewable energy production. And yet on page 15, line 4, when they define new hydro, they basically exclude it by definition. And uh, I'll have an amendment later on to deal with that. But uh, the language in the bill doesn't do what is being claimed uh, is, is occurring. And so uh, the, the, the double speak here is, is really difficult. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Uh, no one on the Democratic side. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm, I've been on this committee for 23 years. Um, I participated at some level in every energy and environmental debate we've had in that 23-year period. And I want the members and, and, and those that are watching the debate to understand something. Um, we're moving from a market-based um, approach to energy, uh, to a, um, I, I don't want to say a political-based approach, that's probably too strong, but um, the majority on the committee is in the process of making determinations that says uh, it's more important uh, that we have a politically correct energy and environmental policy than that we really have a energy policy, an environmental policy that maximizes domestic energy uh, and minimizes um, environmental uh, uh, emissions. Uh, when my good friend, the subcommittee chairman, says that uh, uh, you've got <clears throat> a lot of new nuclear that's going to come online, uh, that's true. At least I hope it's true. <clears throat> but somehow, because it's going to happen, we shouldn't count it. Uh, in the renewable electricity standard that's before the committee, uh, is that that's a political decision. That's that's not a that's not a market-based decision. Uh, nuclear is zero emissions. If the goal of this bill is to reduce uh, CO2 and the other greenhouse gases that the bill um, would would regulate, then Nuclear has to be a part of that equation. It is zero emissions. If we really want to go to a less carbon intensive economy and not totally wreck the economy in the process, there are two fuel choices out there that are going to have to be a part of the equation. One is base load nuclear power for electricity generation, and the other is natural gas. There is a field in Pennsylvania and New York that probably has between 250 and 500 trillion cubic feet of natural gas. Now, natural gas is a fossil fuel, and natural gas will create CO2, but it creates approximately a half to two-thirds as much per, uh, per, uh, per megawatt uh, as coal. 
So I wouldn't argue that, that nuclear is renewable in the sense that hydro is and biomass and wind and solar. But I would argue in the sense that it is zero emissions and clean, it is just as viable. So if we really want to move to a less carbon intensive economy, we should accept definitions that include new nuclear and new hydro, as Mr. Walden has talked about, because they're zero emissions, they're domestic, and they're clean. And so at some point in today's process or tomorrow's process, somebody on our side is going to offer an amendment to the definition of the renewable portfolio standard, renewable electricity standard that's in this bill to include hydro <coughs> and, and nuclear. We're not opposed to wind. We're not opposed to solar. We're not opposed to biomass. We're not opposed to any of those. But we should still keep some shred of a market-based decision process. And then if you want to go beyond that, you can create some incentives to get more wind and more solar and more uh, thermal uh, uh, power uh, in, 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 into the grid. But we have the best energy situation in the world because we have for the last 150 years used a market-based approach. This bill is going away from that. But don't go so far away from it that the, the one totally zero free emission that's, that's, that's base loadable right now, the technology is available right now, uh, take that off the table. You're playing political games when you, when you do things like don't put it in the, in the denominator. That's a political decision. It's not based on fact and all these companies that our good chairman just pointed out that are for this compromise, if you ask them if they're for the Stearns language, uh, especially if they could take a secret ballot, <laughs> they would say yes. They've, they may have accepted this as the best they think they can get, but they don't, they don't believe for a minute it's the best public policy. Stearns moves us to a better public policy. We should vote for it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Gentlemen's time has expired. Who seeks yeah. recognition? Ms. Eschew. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I'd like to yield my time to Mr. Markey. I thank the uh, gentlelady very much. Let me read to you. Um, let me read to you first. We'll begin with uh, John Rowe. John Rowe is the CEO of Exelon. Exelon is the largest nuclear utility in the United States. Twenty percent of all of the United States nuclear industry's power capacity uh, is controlled by that one company, Exelon. Here's what Mr. Rowe in a speech to the National Press Club one week ago said about this bill. Uh, he discussed the bill and he said it will drive the low carbon investments and discourage high carbon investments. Mr. Rowe also stated that the renewable electricity standard contained in the bill should be achievable without undue stress on either the economy oh, no, no, or the reliability of our power supplies. Mr. Rowe continued to hope for a bipartisan result on the House floor in the Senate and that my Republican friends in the Senate will follow the lead of, of their candidate in the last presidential election. This is a real opportunity. So that is the largest electric utility, nuclear electric utility in the United States. I already read to you what Constellation Energy said about this bill. Uh, Mr. Rowe makes specific reference to the renewable electricity standard. Um, again, we are we're, we are not trying here to discriminate against nuclear. Each of the largest nuclear utilities in the United States, uh, for the most part, are supportive of the bill because it does create a climate where nuclear power can revive. But on top of that, there is a production tax credit for nuclear. They, the nuclear industry receives 1.8 cents per kilowatt hour of power generated for the first eight years of nuclear power plant operation. Plants that come online before 2021 are eligible for all or a portion of that tax credit. This is on the par with the production tax credit for renewable power, but the production tax credits for renewables expires in 2012. So they have a better uh, guarantee, a longer term guarantee in the law today. 
uh, in the 2005 Energy Act that was passed out of this committee by you, Mr. Chairman, uh, Mr. Chairman Barton at the time, uh, and President Bush uh, provided upwards of $18.5 billion of loan guarantees for the nuclear uh, power uh, industry. So, and let's go back over the years. Over the years, the nuclear industry has received $145 billion worth of federal subsidies. Combined, the solar and wind industry has received $5 billion. So in talking about socialism, if, if, if you look at what the nuclear industry has received from this committee, what the coal industry in terms of subsidies has received from this committee, the oil industry received in benefits from this committee, it so dwarfs the benefits that we have or even remotely intend to provide for these nascent renewable energy sources. The truth is this entire bill is a clean energy bill. We have in huge subsidies for clean coal, huge, much more than we have in for renewables. We already have all of these nuclear programs as well. No one is saying that any of these technologies are going to be excluded. All we're saying is that over in this area, and it's an exhaustive list, again, it's wind, solar, geothermal, biomass, biogas, hydropower, marine and hydrokinetic renewable energy, fuel cells, landfill gas, wastewater treatment gas, coal mine methane, qualified waste uh, to energy, animal waste, uh, algae, uh, all of this, uh, triple credits for distributed uh, generation. The gentleman all, yield. Uh, let me finish. Please let me finish. All of this offers a real potential for job creation and innovation in our country and the production of new technologies that we can export overseas. The nuclear industry, however, as they look at this bill, these largest of all nuclear utilities in the country, are saying, we support the bill. And as John Rowe is saying from Exelon, specifically saying that the renewable electricity standard is something uh, that he supports. So I know what you're trying to do, but please understand that it's a balanced bill. Nuclear, coal, oil, gas, all these renewables, all part of the mix, including new hydro, okay, all of it. And I just beg you to give these new renewable energy technologies a chance to play their role as well. Move, move. General lady's time has expired. Who seeks recognition? Mr. Upton. Mr. Chairman, I'd, I'd just like to say, I want to go back to my statement a few minutes ago. We shouldn't be picking winners or losers in this bill. Th this amendment is about, and this bill should be re uh, about the overall reduction of emissions especially if they can be carbon free. And so whether it's existing hydro or existing neutral or nuclear or new, new, new hydro or new nuclear, if it reduces carbon emissions, that's the goal that we all want, whether it's wind, solar, hydro, tide, you name it. And this amendment, if it, if it doesn't prevail today, I'd like to think that we ought to have the same debate on the House floor because I'm convinced that folks are going to look at this and say, shouldn't this be part of the mix? And I, for one, would be willing to raise the RPS number overall if we can include that as part of the base, because that means we're going to rely less on foreign energy. And that's what this bill ought to be all about. And if we can do it from renewables, that, ought, that too uh, ought to be where we go. And I, I yield to the, my uh, friend, uh, Mr. Stearns from Florida. Thank you. You know, sometimes you debate, you can talk too much. Uh, but let me just make three points. Um, when I look at this list, Mike Ross has two nuclear power plants in Arkansas. And Ms. Eshoo, there's four in California, uh, uh, Ms. Harmon. Um, there's five, uh, Ms. Uh, Representative Castor in Florida. Mr. Barrow, we have four nuclear power plants in Georgia. Uh, Bobby Rush has 11 in Illinois. Um, there's two in Maryland, Mr. Sarbanes. Mr. Dingell has three. Mr. Pallone has four in New Jersey. Elliot Ingle, you have six in New York. Mr. Butterfield, you have five in North Carolina. Mr. Doyle, you have nine nuclear power plants in Pennsylvania. 
Tennessee, there's three for Mr. Gordon. And of course, in Texas, Mr. Green, you have three nuclear power plants. And Rick Boucher has four in Virginia. My question to all of you, why should states okay. be punished because you have nuclear power plants? If you vote for my amendment, you're going to make it easier for your state to meet the RES standard. But if you vote against it, you're going to increase energy prices, make it harder. Now, particularly a state like California that has so much fiscal problems in trying to meet their, bu their budgets, I would think you'd want a little relief. So states should not be punished because they have nuclear power. So I, I reach across the aisle. You voted with Mr. Waxman on every amendment last night. It doesn't hurt to show independence to vote for the Stearns Amendment, Mr. Doyle. Because, Mr. Doyle, you've got these nuclear power plants. You could rise up and show leadership here by saying, enough is enough. We're going to show bipartisanship, and this is the place we're going to do it. And I have time left for anybody who would like yeah, to. Yeah, will the gentleman yield? Gentleman yield. Well. It's my time. I'll oh, yield I'm to the sorry. gentleman from Oregon. Well, I, I, I understand fully what the gentleman is saying. And certainly with nuclear power, uh, this is a big issue. With hydropower, it's an issue. And the, 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 uh, the gentleman from Massachusetts, Mr. Markey, Keep saying you're all for new hydropower is one of the, and, and the biomass, and we'll continue that debate as well. But the language in your bill precludes new hydropower. Let me say that again. Page 15, line 4, the language precludes new hydropower. So don't tell us that you're all for new hydropower development when your own bill is written in a way that any engineer will tell you precludes that new hydropower from counting because you can't add hydropower to a facility and not manipulate the water behind the facility. We come from hydropower in the West. They manage the flow behind the, the dams all the time. And in fact, in fact, when it comes to wind energy, they praise hydro as a natural match because you store the water when the wind's blowing. And when the wind stops blowing, you release the water to generate the hydropower to balance out the load. So I don't know if you have much hydro in Massachusetts. I don't know if you have much hydro in some of these other states. But we got it in Oregon. We have it in Washington. We have it in Idaho. And they use it to balance out the load. And this language, according to the Bonneville Power Administration, does not work for them. I'm not making this stuff up. These are, I asked the, the head of the Corps of Engineers, who isn't weighing in on the, on the legislation, but in, in my region, could, could you even do an in-stream hydro project and have it count? And he said, I don't think so, because you're going to naturally have some backup behind that, because that's how you produce the energy that runs through it. So the language doesn't work. So at least let's get the language right. The gentleman's time has expired. Are there other members seeking recognition? Mr. Chairman. Chair sees none. Uh, chair recognizes the gentleman from Illinois. Mr. Chimpkus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know John Rowe. John Rowe is a friend of mine, and Mr. Chairman, you're, you're no John Rowe. Um, John Rowe supports Yucca Mountain. John Rowe understands that you can safely transport interstate nuclear waste. John Rowe would never claim, as you have numerous times, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman, about a mobile Chernobyl. John Rowe would never do that. What is John Rowe doing? John Rowe is doing exactly what everyone that you brought in behind closed doors is doing. The responsibility of corporate America, especially the CEO, is to protect shareholder wealth. So they're cutting a deal to make sure that they protect the shareholder wealth, which goes back to the debate. We're fighting for the rate payer. This debate is, who's fighting for the rate payer? The, the corporate titans are my friends, all right? I'm, I'm a Caterpillar supporter. I'm an Exelon supporter. I'm an Ameren supporter. I, a lot of these companies that have negotiated deals, they support me. But I know that they're in the room to protect shareholder wealth, the wealth of the bondholders, the wealth of the stockholders. And that's OK. Because they, they are afraid that if they're not in the room, they're going to be destroyed. And that's what, that's, so who's talking for the rate 
taxpayer. That's what this debate is about. I question to counsel. What is the emissions difference between the carbon emissions difference between new nuclear and old nuclear? I don't have that information at the table. Would the chairman like to respond about the difference between the carbon emissions between new nuclear and old nuclear? Does the gentleman know the answer? I do know the answer. Oh, good. So uh, I'd like to uh, never ask a question that you don't know the answer well, to, I, Mr. I, Chairman. I, you taught me that. I, I want to dial a friend, and I'm going to call John Shimkus. <laughs> I'm going to ask John Shimkus for the answer. Okay. Well, all right, we have John Shimkus on the on the line. How about 50-50? Uh, the question is, 50, what is 50. the difference between old? There is no difference in no carbon emissions. No difference. Oh. But let me but let me ask another question. Since Thank part you. of this bill talks about indirect land use and renewable fuel calculation, let me ask you now a more difficult question, Mr. Chairman. What is the indirect carbon use of new nuclear plants? If you're going to build a new nuclear facility, what would, if you were going to calculate carbon emissions, would building a new nuclear power plant create more carbon emissions or less carbon emissions? You know, this is a lot like being up in my district at MIT because up there a lot of the questions actually come in the form of answers. Um, and it really simplifies things for you when you're having a discussion. So I'm assuming that I'm in that kind of a discussion again. So the answer is? There will be more, a bigger carbon footprint when you build a new nuclear power plant than an existing power plant. Okay, uh, just now, nuclear, building a new nuclear power plant has 10 times more job creation ability than anything in this renewable portfolio development. Cost per kilowatt hour of nuclear power base load generation is approximately a half to less of kilowatt power. That's the concern about renewables just keeping it at wind and solar because it costs more. So if you're worried about the rate payer, you need strong base load generation. I want to end on this. Take a steel mill that uses 545 megawatts a year. It would require roughly 138 turbines on roughly 12,443 acres of land for a total output. However, during peak load at that steel mill, it requires 100,000 kilowatts. For that, you would need roughly 825 turbines, turbines and on 33,000 acres of land to account for peak load. And remember, renewable power is never can be relied upon for base load generation because the wind is not always going to blow and the sun is not always going to shine. Uh, so. If you're concerned about the rate payer, you would support this amendment, and I yield back my time. I think we've had a good debate on this amendment, and I hope the members are ready to proceed to a vote. Mr. Chairman? Uh, who, who seeks recognition? <laughs> Gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Doyle. Yes, and I, and I certainly won't take five minutes, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I want to thank my good friend, Mr. Stearns, for uh, asking us all to exhibit some independence. I'm trying to remember in the seven years I've been on this committee, how, my, how many times he uh, exhibited independence when the shoe was on the other foot. And I think I can count it on one finger. Uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. I, Doyle, I mean, having said that, just Mr. one Chairman, thing. I, I voted I'll, yesterday I'll, with which you. Which finger? I, 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 voted, <laughs> I voted with you yesterday. I was the only Republican. Did you okay, know that? I, I, I'm sorry, Cliff. I take it back. On two fingers, I can count how many times. Mr. Chairman, and, 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 and I want to thank my friend for reminding me that we have nine nuclear power plants in Pennsylvania. Uh, my state has a renewable energy standard. Pennsylvania's is 18 percent. Uh, we have a two-tiered system of, of how you can meet that standard. Uh, nowhere in Tier 1 or Tier 2 do we uh, allow nuclear to be, be counted as, as part of the mix? We, we allow photovoltaic, solar thermal, wind, low impact hydro, geothermal, biomass, uh, biologically derived methane gas, coal mine, methane, and fuel cells 
And our uh, tier two is waste coal, distributed generation systems, demand side management, large scale hydro, municipal solid waste, wood pulping and manufacturing byproducts, and integrated gasification combined cycles. So uh, Pennsylvania is well aware of, of how we meet an RES standard in our state. It's 18 percent. We don't include nuclear. <laughs> Uh, I, I think this amendment uh, that we've reached in the bill is a pretty good accommodation, and uh, I, I intend to uh, oppose the amendment. Thank Would you, Mr. Chairman. Would the gentleman yield? Sure. I, 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 it's my understanding that the base for, that Pennsylvania uses for the 18 percent includes coal. Includes? The, coal? Waste coal. Waste coal? Yeah, waste coal. Would you, would, you, would you accept that as part of this amendment? Well, now that's not about your amendment. Your amendment was nuclear, and I'm, I'm speaking Well, what about if we add it? Well, you know what? That's a separate amendment you can offer, and we'll talk to you then. But Mr. Right. Stearns' amendment talks about nuclear, and he was kind enough to remind us that I have nine nuclear yeah. plants in my state, and that somehow that yeah. I should be affected by that. And I'm saying my state has a standard. Nuclear is not part of it. I yield back. Would, would the gentleman you, yields back. Would the gentleman yield to me for just comment, not, not a question. Sure. I just want to say that um, we're having a pretty good debate, and We've already had two great lines. We've had the Ed Markey, I'm going to dial John Shimkus, which beat anything he said yesterday. <laughs> and the Lee Terry line, which finger is probably going to make YouTube. So <laughs> we're, we're starting off pretty good today, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the chair would only note that uh, we've sunk to a new low if we're, if we're, if we're debating for YouTube. <laughs> it is what it is. It is what it is. Uh, we'll now proceed to a vote. Chairman? Who seeks recognition? Mr. Boyer, for what move, purpose do you seek recognition? I move to strike the last word. You feel you must uh, speak on this amendment? I move to strike the last word. Gentlemen, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. What I encourage all members to do is exactly what I've been doing. Go to EEI, find out what the uh, breakout of your energy portfolio is per congressional district. When you do that and you do the math, you'll figure out where you fall out. What I find most interesting, it also, well, let me just show you what I've, what I've learned. And I'll start with, uh, I went to Speaker Pelosi. In order, in order to make, and I, and I looked at Mr. Welsh, I looked at Mr. Inslee, and I looked at my own in Indiana. So here's what, I, here's what I've learned. When I do the calculations, I look at uh, uh, Ms. Pelosi. She has 23% nuclear. 13% hydro, 47% natural gas, and 4% coal, 1% fossil fuel. So when I do that, I say, OK, with regard to base generation, 75% there is, is going to be actually more than that. She's got 23% old nuclear, natural gas, coal, and old fossil. You add all that to, to figure out what your base is. Or excuse me, then you, when you get your base, that's seven, that's five, there you go, 75%. Now you go, of what her base then is 25%. Then of that base of 25%, what is 20% of the 25%? Guess what? She fits. It absolutely works because she is 12% renewables. Gee, what a shock. We've actually come up with an equation that the Speaker Pelosi has no penalties whatsoever. Amazing. Now, I'll look at my state of Indiana. In Indiana, let's see, I'm 96% coal, I'm 3% natural gas, I'm 99.6% is my baseline. So in order to create my base, I'm at 0.4%. I got to get, tw well, I got a long way to go. I get a huge penalty. You can, you can do this per congressional district. If, if you look at, at uh, uh, Mr. Inslee, for example, I looked at, looked at this one. Mr. Inslee of Washington, he's 91% hydro, 5% nuclear, he's 3% wind, and less than 1% coal and natural gas. I think that's extraordinary. I think that's absolutely wonderful. But then when I look at that and say, okay, of his base, what does he have left? He has to do then 20% of a base of 9%. 20% less of the base of 9%. It works. He fits. There's no penalty. You can go down the line per congressional district 
And I, if, I'll do it. I'll figure out where the votes are. This is pretty doggone easy. And that's, I guess that's how, that's, that's how we do it. Cutting deals, getting votes, figuring out the equation, satisfying people. That's, what, that's what's been done here. Who pays and who doesn't? That's right. It comes down to who's going to pay and who doesn't. And so now I, it's Mr. Shimkus's point exactly. Who's going to look out for the little guy? So I, I'm really bothered by, by this. If we really want to do it by sound public policy, stop the games. Because that's what we have here. These are games. Gentleman yield. Someone is at stake. Gentleman yield. I'd be more than happy to yield. Are you suggesting that I did something untoward here about No, I'm just this? saying you're the benefit of a great equation. Yeah, I, I just want to make this really clear that no, you are I not I reclaim my time. You are the benefit of a great equation. Would you I'm upset because the state of Indiana, I am penalized in the state of Indiana. The Midwest is penalized. You are going to receive a great benefit in the Pacific Northwest. What we should do if we really care about, quote, the emissions of CO2, then let's create um, a, a permits based on the emissions. Don't do good taxpayer giveaway to utilities out there that Indiana, we have to go out then in the market and then buy these. First of all, whose money is it anyway? Trillions of dollars of taxpayers' money? We're going to take it from taxpayers, and you're making it sound as though we're giving it to someone? No, we're taking it. We've got to borrow it from China. I, I, I just, I encourage all members to get into the bill, look at your energy portfolio, and do the math so you'll know where you fall out. With that, I yield back. Gentleman yields back his time. Mr. Inslee, do you wish to be recognized? I do, and I'm sorry to... Would you be willing to be recognized for three minutes? Yes, certainly. I, I, I'm sorry to have to talk at this late moment, but given the last comments, I think it's necessary. And I think we were having a good, healthy debate until the last, last little round there. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is we have a very diverse country. Uh, where I live, we're blessed with abundant hydropower. We've done well on, on, on clean energy, not because of great leadership from a House member, but because we have some great rivers out in the Northwest. And we have struggled mightily to try to develop an energy policy that responds to all of our districts. And that is why in this bill we have made very substantial progress in ameliorating the differences of our areas. We have ameliorated it by reducing the target. We have ameliorated it by adding a clean energy bank that will help finance nu new nuclear power. We have ameliorated it by including $1 billion for coal research that goes only to coal research for those areas, like the previous speakers, that are heavily coal dependent. We have found every way under this green earth with the gentleman from Washington. Now let me finish for a moment to ameliorate the fact that we have different districts. But I want to answer a fundamental question that Mr. Stern's amendment proposes, which is a very important one. Why, if nuclear power and hydropower are zero CO2 emitting, are they treated differently than wind or concentrated solar energy? That is a very important question for us to answer. And the answer is this. Whereas nuclear and and hydro are very clean and very efficient and very efficacious. They are not new. The effort on the renewable electrical standard is as much to make new types of technology as it is to make renewable energy. Hydropower is perfectly renewable and perfectly clean, but it is old unless you do run of the river. And by the way, I, I want to tell you there's some new technology run of the river where you don't have to dam it and you get energy that is included in this. James. The thrust of the Will renewable the electrical standard... Will the gentleman yield? Just a minute, let me finish. The thrust of the renewable electrical standard is to create new technologies. If we voted for this amendment, you will get less concentrated solar technology in America. You will get less advanced wind in America. You will get less at, you will get less engineered geothermal in America. You will get less cellulosic biofuels in America. You will get less algae-based biofuels in America. You will get less advanced efficiency in America. You will get less hydrokinetic energy from wave power, a new source of energy, and tidal power, which are included in this bill. So let us not forget 
There is a difference between old and new. We will never skin this cat unless we create new energy technologies. We can do that without this amendment. Thank you. All right. Uh, can I be recognized? Uh, who seeks recognition? If the gentleman, would the gentleman be willing to take two minutes? Yeah, I'll try and keep it. Let's do two minutes, minutes and then uh, we're going to proceed to a vote. And I hope we don't have to vote to vote, but I think, I think uh, an hour and a half on a, one amendment is enough time. Gentleman is recognized. I, I appreciate that. And I do think that, that this nuclear component is important enough to have this level uh, and time for discussion. But, but adding up what uh, the gentleman from Washington has said in Massachusetts, this, this bill is about climate change, global warming, and reducing CO2. And it doesn't, uh, what we should be doing is allowing each region to use what type of clean energies. And I'm going to tell you, I only have wind and the ability to do nuclear. Uh, so I want to support nuclear power. Uh, so I, this argument of limiting nuclear power because somehow it's going to step on wind and solar doesn't make sense to me. As long as we can get to zero emissions and generate electricity, let's do it. And I'll yield to my friend from Indiana. When, Mr. Inslee, when I look at the math with regard to your particular district and just listen to your arguments, if you included hydro into the base, then you get penalized. Because as of right now, in your base, you're completely covered because you're at 3% wind. Your base is at 9% of the total pie. But if you include hydro, you're going to get penalized. So um, actually, from your perspective, no, you won't get penalized. You should encourage yourself to be hydro to be included in the base so you can get the new clean technologies that you've just argued for. Jim, Why don't you offer an amendment then to include hydro in the base? to include new nuclear in the base. So that fits your argument to want to have clean jobs in your district. But you're not doing that. You're not doing that because the math tells you you're completely covered in your 3% wind. When you get 20% of the 9%, you're clean. You're good to go. Gentlemen, yield just for a moment. Absolutely. Thank you. Uh, actually, I supported a higher standard for the country and the state of Washington. In order to reach a compromise, we lowered it. But in the state of Washington, just so you'll know, my constituents voted by an initiative to adopt a stronger standard than we're even going to have here. I am comfortable my constituents answered your question, which is they want new technology, and they passed a state referendum to say that. We've already right. done this. Thank well, you. you're covered by this bill. The all time has expired. We only have one amendment to vote on, although a lot of different ideas have been discussed. And that amendment is the Stearns Amendment. All those in favor of the Stearns Amendment will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. 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 Mr. Chairman, ask for a roll call. Uh, we'll ask, uh, wait, uh, Mr. Barton, ask for a roll call. We'll proceed to a roll call vote. Mr. Waxman. No. Mr. Waxman, no. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Dingle, no. Mr. Markey. Mr. Markey, no. Mr. Boucher. Mr. Pallone, Mr. Gordon, Mr. Rush, Ms. Eshoo, Ms. Eshoo votes no, Mr. Stupak, Mr. Stupak, no, Mr. Engel, Mr. Engel, no, Mr. Green, Ms. DeGette, Ms. DeGette votes no, Mrs. Caps, Mrs. Caps, no, Mr. Doyle, Mr. Doyle, no. Ms. Ms. Harmon, Ms. Harmon, no. Ms. Joukowsky, Ms. Joukowsky, no. Mr. Gonzalez, Mr. Gonzalez, no. Mr. Inslee, Mr. Inslee votes no. Ms. Baldwin, Ms. Baldwin, no. Mr. Ross, Mr. Weiner, Mr. Weiner, no. Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson, aye. Mr. Butterfield. Mr. Butterfield votes no. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Barrow. Mr. Barrow votes aye. Mr. Hill. Ms. Matsui. Ms. Matsui, no. Mrs. Christensen. Mrs. Christensen, no. Ms. Castor. Ms. Castor, no. Mr. Sarbanes. 
Mr. Sarbanes, no. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Space. Mr. Space, no. Mr. McNerney. Mr. McNerney, no. Ms. Sutton. Ms. Sutton, no. Mr. Braley. Mr. Welch. Mr. Welch, no. Mr. Barton. Aye. Mr. Barton votes aye. Mr. Hall. Mr. Upton. Aye. Mr. Upton, aye. Mr. Stearns. Aye. Mr. Stearns, aye. Mr. Deal. Aye. Mr. Deal, aye. Mr. Whitfield. Aye. Mr. Whitfield votes aye. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shattuck. Aye. Mr. Shattuck, aye. Mr. Blunt. Mr. Booyer. Aye. Mr. Booyer votes aye. Mr. Radonovich. Mr. Pitts. Aye. Mr. Pitts, aye. Ms. Bonomack. Ms. Bonomack, aye. Mr. Walden. Mr. Walden, aye. Mr. Terry. Aye. Mr. Terry votes aye. Mr. Rogers. Aye. Mr. Rogers, aye. Mrs. Myrick. Mrs. Myrick, aye. Mr. Sullivan. Mr. Sullivan, aye. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania. Mr. Murphy of Pennsylvania, aye. Mr. Burgess. Mr. Burgess, aye. Ms. Blackburn. Ms. Blackburn, aye. Mr. Gingry. Mr. Gingry votes aye. Mr. Scalise. Mr. Scalise, aye. Mr. Voucher. Mr. Voucher votes no. Mr. Green. Mr. Green votes no. Mr. Gordon. Mr. Gordon votes no. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall. Mr. Hall votes aye. Mr. Melanson. Mr. Melanson votes aye. Mr. Hill. Mr. Hill votes aye. Have all members responded to the roll? Mr. Ross. Mr. Ross votes aye. Yes. Mr. Shimkus. Mr. Shimkus votes aye. Have all members responded to the call of the roll, Mr. Murphy? Which Mr. Murphy? Uh, Mr. Murphy from Connecticut is walking in the door, and Mr. Rodonovich also seeks recognition. Yeah, yeah you'll be in a, you'll be in a, called in a minute. Ooh. Mr. Radonovich? Yes. Not recorded, Mr. Chairman. Now he's recorded voting aye. Votes aye. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut. Mr. Murphy of Connecticut votes no. Have all members responded to the call of the roll? Any member wish to change his or her vote? Mr. Chairman. Yeah. Mr. Barton? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to uh, okay. change my vote from uh, aye to no. Mr. Barton wishes to change his vote from aye to no. Mr. Pallone, how do you wish to vote? You wish to vote with Mr. Barton, no. Who's that? I'm sorry. Mr. Pallone was no? Mr. Pallone's no. Mr. Pallone Mr. votes no. And Mr. Barton? Change from aye to no. Mr. Barton is off aye and on no. Any other member wish to be recorded or change a vote? If not, the clerk will tally the vote.
just gives us the right to re I can read it. Yes. Clerk On that vote, Mr. Vote. Chairman, the yeas were 26 and the ayes were 30. 26 ayes, 30 noes. The amendment is not agreed to. Are there other amendments? Mr. I have Green. an amendment at the desk. Uh, gentleman seeks recognition to offer an amendment. Uh, is it uh, to this title? Yes, it's to this title. And, it has, and the clerk will inform us, has it been available? Sharon Davis, is, has this amendment, oh, you've got it. I'm sorry. Has this I'm amendment sorry. been available for requisite period of time? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the, please report, the clerk will please report the amendment by Mr. Green. Amendment offered by Mr. Green of Texas. In section 786B1B2, strike source and, in, and insert emission point. Gentlemen, Mr. Texas Chairman, I reserve point of order. Gentlemen, uh, reserved a point of order. Burgess did. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The primary purpose for carbon dioxide transportation storage lies within the oil and gas uh, sector. The sector has been injecting carbon into geological uh, formations through enhanced oil recovery methods that have provided the bulk of knowledge on the CCS technologies to date. Our testimony uh, bore that up. Early CCS demonstration projects are critical to begin reducing cost and uncertainty and to stimulate rapid deployment of CCS technology. I want to thank Chairman, Subcommittee Chairman Boucher for his leadership on these issues and for the strong CCS framework he's created in the bill. My amendment seeks to clarify one word within Section 115 which relates to the commercial deployment of carbon capture and sequestration technology. In order for oil and gas sector to take advantage of the bonus allowance of value for CCS in H.R. 2450 Four. It's critical that the word source on page 77, line 2, be amended to read emission point. A typical refinery will have more than 20 major emission points, heaters, process vents, boilers, with emissions over 2 million tons per year. Well, gentlemen, you? Yes. We're prepared to accept it. If you want to save some time, we'll take sure. it. Sure. Mr. Chairman. Uh, if gentlemen yield to me, I thank you for this amendment. It makes a technical change in the bonus allowance section for carbon capture and sequestration, so the appropriate point at an industrial source that is conducting carbon <laughs> capture and sequestration is identified in the bill. We certainly would support it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I'd like to ask me, Mr. Consent, to have such a great statement. At least I'd have, like to have it in the record. Without objection, the full statement of the gentleman from Texas will be made part of the record. We'll now proceed to a vote. All those in favor? Hey, Mr. Chairman. Who seeks recognition? Uh, Mr. Walden from Oregon would withdraw his uh, Gentleman withdraws his point of order. All those in favor of the Green Amendment say aye. Aye. Oppose no. The ayes have it and the amendment is agreed to. Are there further amendments? Mr. Uh, Shattuck. Mr. Chairman, I have an amendment. Gentleman seeks recognition to offer an amendment. And is it to this title? Clerk will uh, inform us of the timeliness of the filing of this amendment. Yes, Mr. Chairman, it was received in time. Clerk will please report the amendment. Amendment offered by Mr. Shattig. Without objection, the amendment will be considered as read. The gentleman from Arizona is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. One of the uh, biggest controversy surrounding this leg legislation, which is intended to address uh, global warming and uh, greenhouse gas emissions, is the global nature of the problem. That is to say, uh, the emission of carbon dioxide, which is sought to be controlled by this legislation, occurs not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Uh, many of us are deeply concerned that other countries around the world uh, will not control their greenhouse gas emissions and will have a competitive advantage and indeed that jobs will be lost from this country to countries which fail to impose uh, any greenhouse gas emissions or any carbon dioxide emission limits. Uh, indeed, yesterday during the uh, questioning, Mr. Scalise pointed out that 
55 pages of the current legislation are dedicated to job loss, uh, and it was noted that that was because the proponents of the bill are genuinely concerned about taking care of those who might lose their jobs in the transition. Uh, this amendment is a simple and straightforward amendment. It goes not to uh, suspension of the bill, uh, just to the reporting of factual information and disclosure. It's an amendment that calls for transparency, sunshine, uh, and public information. What the amendment says is that uh, once per year, uh, the Department of State and the U.S. Trade Representatives shall prepare a report to Congress regarding whether China and India have adopted greenhouse gas emission standards, uh, and assuming they have not, will once a year notify members of Congress uh, of their determination and will publicize that determination uh, in the country. Obviously, Americans have a right to know whether greenhouse gas emissions are being uh, uh, restricted or capped or limited uh, or restrained throughout the other parts of the world, but in particular in those nations which pose the greatest job threat to those of us in America and to American jobs and American workers. My colleague, Mr. Simkus, has pointed out repeatedly that what we are trying to do uh, on this side of the aisle is look out for the little guy whose job is threatened uh, and try to make sure that uh, indeed uh, he has a chance under this legislation not to be punished or suffered. The proponents of this legislation argue uh, compellingly they believe uh, that if we adopt the provisions of this bill, then other nations around the world, including, uh, importantly, our biggest competitors uh, in this field, China and India, will limit their greenhouse gases as well. Uh, and indeed, uh, there is belief that if we take the passage of this legislation uh, into foreign discussions and into conferences on the topics of greenhouse uh, gas emissions and on global warming, uh, the passage of this legislation will pressure those countries to limit their greenhouse gases. This amendment, uh, I would hope, is non-controversial. It simply provides that once per year uh, a survey will be conducted to determine if uh, China and India in particular, though it could be expanded to cover other countries as well, have adopted greenhouse gas emission standards uh, similar to those or as strict as those here in the United States so that we know we are limiting greenhouse gases throughout the world. Many of us are concerned that this legislation will result in jobs being moved from the United States because plants will close in the United States, go to other countries uh, and begin operating and will emit more greenhouse gases than those same plants would have emitted here in the United States. Clearly, uh, the American people and members of Congress deserve to know what efforts are being made uh, to limit greenhouse gas emissions elsewhere throughout the world, and particularly uh, by our competitors around the world, to assure ourselves that we're not losing jobs to those countries. Uh, I believe it is a sound amendment. It provides information to the American people. It is critically needed. It provides information to members of Congress, uh, and I would strongly urge its adoption. Will the gentleman yield? Certainly. If we took that first um, sentence where we say the administrator in consultation with Department of State U.S. Trade Representative shall annually prepare and certify a report to Congress regarding whether China and India have adopted greenhouse gas emission standards at least as strict as those standards are required under the Act, this Act, and stop there, we could accept it. Would you be willing to make that um, accommodation? Uh, uh, reclaiming my time, I, I guess I'm, I, I would I certainly would think about it. I'd be interested in knowing why you would not want the information reported, uh, assuming it's gathered, or why you would not want it reported to members of Congress or the American people. Well, you, you asked then, they notify each member of Congress, release this to the media, seek to publicize such determination in congressional districts in the United States. That's, you know, that's a lot. This is you know, a, lot of, a lot of extra busy work. Once a report is out, I'm sure that members of Congress We'll, uh, we'll take note of it. Uh, well, l let's go through those one at a time. Certainly, uh, Mr. Chairman, you would not have a problem with each member of Congress being notified, would you? Calls for a that that can't be very burdensome. Well, it calls for a report to Congress. So you right. want each member notified but that report as well. Most reports to Congress don't go separately to each individual member. Uh, yeah, regrettably. <laughs> You're not getting those reports, I gather. <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> as low down the table as I am. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, if I would propose to, uh, to leave the second sentence and uh, strike uh, to the word media and strike the balance of the sentence. 
So it's given to each member of Congress and released to the media. Certainly you can't be against that. Sounds, that. that sounds reasonable to me. Are you willing to accept a yes? I, I, I've been trained pretty well to accept a yes, Mr. Chairman. Okay. Uh, without objection, the amendment will be modified. And, uh, and then uh, now the question comes on this amendment. All those in favor of, um, of the um, Shattuck Amendment as modified, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, no. The ayes have it and the amendment's agreed to. Yeah. Uh, will, so will someone inform Mr. Stearns? <laughs> and they say the Congress isn't bipartisan. Uh, we have uh, we've had a, a great deal of amendments to Title I. The chair is willing to entertain amendments to Title II. Uh, well, uh, we can do that, but let's see if, if we can move on to. You won't be precluded. Title I or two? You won't be precluded from offering huh? an amendment. Is it to Title Par Parliamentary number? inquiry. Yes. My parliamentary inquiry is, is now that you're moving to Title II, I'd like for the record, I have four amendments on Title I, and I'd like that right preserved to offer, and I'd like to know when I could offer those amendments. A uh, gentleman will have his rights protected to offer uh, amendments to Title I, and uh, we would uh, 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 certainly guarantee uh, the amendments to be in order at the uh, completion of the bill. Completion bill. Right. And all the other titles. Yep. Thank you. Are there amendments to Title II? M Mr. Chairman, I, I have a quick qu parliamentary inquiry. Yes, state your uh, I know it's the Democratic side, but I have five amendments that I can do in block for Title I. But it's the Democratic we, we, we. Matheson, see. Okay. So, <coughs> okay. Uh, we need to go to the Democratic side first, and then uh, we'll come back to the Republican. Parliamentary inquiry. Yes, gentlemen, status parliamentary inquiry. I, there is nervousness, and I want you to bring a calm to Mr. Chairman on the Republican side. That this, it, we, you are by procedure moving. We're, we're, we're very accustomed to moving title, exhausting amendments, going to the next title. Yes. And so we have. Many of us have amendments per title, and we want your assurance that when we get after the third title, that that you will not entertain a motion for a previous question, excluding our amendments. Well, the chair can't talk about what amendments would or procedural votes would be called uh, sometime tomorrow. We're going to try to process the amendments, but if we really have 400 amendments. Yeah. And it took for, us uh, well, so, many, so many hours to just do a couple well, this morning. Further parliamentary inquiry. Time. Yes. Does the committee have the assurance that you would not support a, a motion on, of, to move the previous question until our uh, amendments have been offered? Let me, let me give you this assurance. We will have further opportunity for Title I amendments. In this markup. In this markup. <laughs> In this week. All right. All right. In this bill. Um, to go to the Democratic side, I want to now call on Ms. Matsui. You seek recognition to offer an amendment, is that correct? Mr. Chairman, I'd like to offer an on block amendment. That would be my amendment, including uh, also Ms. Baldwin's two amendments, Ms. Eshoo's and Mr. Welch's. Without objection, the amendments will be considered and block. The uh, clerk will report the amendments. And the amendments will be distributed. Is the uh, clerk prepared to? Almost. 
Mr. Chairman, uh, amendment in the Amendment offered by Ms. Matsui of California. After Section 204 insert. Uh, without objection, that amendment be, be considered as read. Okay. Amen amendment offered by Mr. Welch and Ms. DeGette. Without objection. Title two, add the following. That, uh, without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. Mr. Chairman. Amendment offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin. Without objection, that D. amendment will be considered as read. Does that conclude the... Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, yes, just, parliamentary just, inquiry? Just, just one minute. I'm going to recognize... Okay, thank you. Right. Okay. Amendment offered by Ms. Baldwin of Wisconsin at the end of subtitle D of Title II add the following new sections. Without objection, that amendment will be considered as read. Amendment offered by Ms. Eshu of California in Title II add... At the Without end objection, the that amendment will be considered as read. Does that complete the amendments yes, in Mr. block? Yes, it does. Uh, who sought recognition? Uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, yes, Mr. Rodonovich. Uh, reserve a point of order on those. The gentleman reserves a point of order on the amendments. Uh, the chair would yield uh, f uh, five minutes to the gentlelady from California uh, on the amendments. I thank the gentleman for yielding me time. My amendment today is to meant to strengthen the building efficiency portion of the bill by making homes and small office buildings more energy efficient. The built environment is responsible for a significant portion of greenhouse gas emissions. My amendment creates a simple grant program that will provide funding to utilities across the country to invest in tree planting programs that are designed to reduce peak load demand. In places like Tucson, Austin, and Iowa, Utilities have used this strategy as an effective method to manage their customers' demand. In my district, our local electric utility has planted thousands of trees in recent years around homes throughout Sacramento. This has saved the equivalent of 30,000 air conditioning units through energy efficiency gains. It has sequestered 600 tons of ozone and more than 700 tons of particulate matter. This program has also saved participating consumers between 25 and 40 percent on their energy bills each month. Across the United States, there are 100 million available sites across the country for strategic tree planting. If we were to take advantage of all these available slots, the potential energy efficiency savings are enormous, over $1 billion. This is a win-win amendment because it helps lower our constituents' energy bills increases the commitment of this legislation to building energy efficiency and gives local utilities the tools they need to help their consumers manage electricity demand. With that, I yield back my time. To will, the, will the gentlelady yield? Yes, I'll yield to the gentlelady. Um, Thank you. Uh, I um, uh, wanted to briefly explain the two amendments um, that are under consideration that I've offered. Both of these amendments address the motor market, motors used in pumps, compressors, uh, material handling, material processing, food processing, conveyors, fans, blowers, escalators, and elevators. Um, the language in both these amendments has been incorporated in the Senate Appliance Standards Bill and is supported by uh, Mr. Ross and myself. In the Energy Independence and Security Act, a new efficiency standard was set that mandates motor efficiencies beyond those established in the 1992 Energy Policy Act. This upgrade to premium efficient motors will raise initial motor costs um, by an estimated 10 to 15 percent. Therefore, there is a concern that due to initial costs, some may be inclined to simply repair and extend the life of old and inefficient motors. As a result, the First Amendment before us would provide a rebate of $25 per horsepower uh, per customer for a high-efficiency motor. These funds will help uh, end users in offsetting the cost difference between repair and replacement of low-efficiency uh, motors. Specifically, it would provide a subsidy through distributors who would be responsible for documenting the sale and for proper disposal of the old motor through distributors. The National Electrical Manufacturers Association and the, National, um, and the American Council for an Efficient uh, Energy Efficient Economy both support this amendment and um, estimate replacement 
of at least 1 percent of old motors each would save an estimated 1.5 billion um, kilowatt hours annually. 1.5 billion kilowatt hours annually. Further, the uh, um, assessment. Would the gentleman lady yield? Yes. Uh, in order to maybe get back to Title I, uh, our side is willing to accept the amendment? Uh, both of them? Good. We have an in block. They're in bunk. They're on block. Yes. Great. No. no. Oh. <laughs> the, uh, then I'll keep on. Uh, well, let, sorry. For it that. sounds like we're ready for the vote some on the end block okay, amendment. Some are not. All those. All right. All those in favor of the end block amendments Jeez. will say aye. 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 Opposed, no. Pardon no. Me, question. How do you cut off debate? How do you cut off debate? The uh, chairman, the chairman of the subcommittee, said that your side was willing to accept the amendment on the Baldwin amendment, not the on block in total. And so the the point of the parliamentary procedure was that you parliamentary without part. objection, the vote will be rescinded. Uh, yeah, we'll return to debate. Uh, Ms. Baldwin, you were you were you've explained your amendment, but I gather they don't care. For well, I, I, any further debate because they agree with yours. But which um, well, let me, uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, if I could just clarify. Yes. Two uh, among the unblock, I have two amendments, and so I just want to clarify that they've accepted which both of them. We, no, no. Which, which, which amendment are we accepting? Why don't we uh, go vote on the House floor, and we all figure out uh, which ones we can support, which ones you oppose, and then we'll focus on the, those issues. So we stand in recess. Back, we have three votes. Should we come back at 1 o'clock? Uh, we will come back at uh, 1 o'clock. <laughs>this markup hearing on energy and climate change legislation is taking a recess for votes on the house floor this is day three of the hearing and once the committee approves the bill it goes to the house floor while we wait for members to return we'll show you a segment from this morning's washington journal with virginia congressman rick voucher he serves on the house energy and commerce committee and he'll talk about the markup uh, process and what democrats hope to get out of it 
Representative Rick Boucher, a Democrat of Virginia and a key member of the Energy and Commerce Committee, which is spending this whole week marking up an energy and climate legislation. Mr. Boucher, let me show our viewers the headline of a Politico piece, a recent one, Key Dem.